Yeah. Recording has started. Very good. So, uh, I have countries being represented. I have Malaysia, Cambodia, Vietnam, Pakistan, Laos, Philippines, and uh, Thailand. Are there any additional countries represented on the line that I have not noticed yet? Anybody from Pakistan? I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, anybody from uh, Bangladesh? Bangladesh, um, Nepal, and we should also have uh, Indonesia. See a few more people coming online from Thailand. Nui, thank you for posting the agenda. I see a, a few a few of the names look uh, familiar with uh, those that joined us yesterday. So before we we begin uh, today's session, uh, I hope you enjoyed the session yesterday and, and learned something out of out of that session. Uh, we had uh, several presentations. Uh, all all of these items that have been presented yesterday and all of the items that are being presented today will be made available to you electronically. So uh, this will all be, be sent to you uh, via email. So yesterday we, we started off with an overview of good laboratory practices and the personnel involved. Uh, we went through an, a, an actual protocol to see what kind of information the protocol contains. Uh, we went over a list of standard operating procedures that was uh, prepared by somebody from the University of Hawaii that was working on the dragon fruit study. And then we uh, looked through the standard operating procedure for quality assurance auditing, as well as the form. And then we um, we talked about uh, sprayer calibration and had a uh, an explanation on how to calibrate the sprayer, uh, the calculations, and also how to use uh, the metronome. So everybody knows where the metronome is now, right? Has everybody downloaded it to your to your phone? Some of you will be be needing that. Okay, so I see some other people have joined. Now we have representation from Bangladesh. Very good. All right. Let's see any other countries? Do we have anybody from Nepal online? If, if anybody from Nepal is, is online, if you'd please sign in. At this point, I, I have not noticed anybody from Nepal. Also, Indonesia. If there's anybody from Indonesia online, uh, Please, please sign in so we we know who is actually on the line, All right? So currently we have uh, 39 people on the line, which is pretty good. Oh, okay, uh, Rajiv Das, oh, you're from Nepal. Yes, very good. So we're still adding to the... Um, the people signed online. But remember, if, if you have signed in 
uh, please, if you haven't done it already, please include your name and also your email. We would greatly appreciate that. Thank you. All right. So are, are there any questions over any of the information that we covered yesterday? If you'd like to ask a question, please uh, sign into the chat box. Okay. Very good. So are there any other questions before we, we begin today's session? Has everybody been practicing with their metronome? All right. Well, uh, I'd like to introduce to you uh, Dr. Nan Chai Kyung from uh, Malaysia. He's with the organization Marty. Uh, he's been working with IR4, I think it was since about 2012, if I believe. So Malaysia was the very first country to uh, start on the STDF project. And again, uh, they've taken on some additional responsibility in this program uh, by uh, starting to look into some of the potential issues with chemical compatibility. For those of you who participated in our inception workshop, if you recall how we plan to, to, to work on this project, uh, there's kind of two phases to the field work. So in phase one, we're going to have a combination of a number of chemicals, or active ingredients applied simultaneously in some of the crops that you're working with. And then we will do a residue decline study. And then in phase two, uh, we will select some of the active ingredients and follow that up with a residue mitigation study whereby uh, we are going to be ending the use of the conventional chemical at a certain period of time and then follow it up to control the pest with a biopesticide that is appropriate for that particular pest. So in order to do the phase one, we need to uh, see whether or not the chemicals which we'll be combining have any issues as far as compatibility. And so I, uh, again, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Nan, and he will be making the first presentation. So uh, Nui, if you can please uh, bring up the first slide from the presentation from Nan. Okay, Nan, so you have the floor. Whenever you want to change the slide, please uh, tell Nui that you would like the next slide, please. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, good uh, morning, afternoon, and evening to all the participants of this uh, virtual workshop. So now I would like to make uh, my presentation on field training experiences and chemical compatibility. I believe uh, some of you has uh, witnessed uh, or viewed this slide before in the lab training uh, workshop. Uh, actually, uh, the slide. I uh, was presented by my colleague, Mr. Shahid. So now uh, Michael has given me opportunity again to present in this uh, field training workshop. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so in this presentation, I will mainly touch on two main items. The first will be a uh, few as training experience uh, when we learn how to conduct uh, 
field phase of the residual studies under the guidance of Dr. Michael Braverman. And after that, will be followed by the chemical compatibility test as mentioned by Michael uh, on how we're going to uh, mix the pesticide formulation product and to see whether the pesticide solution mixture are compatible or not. Next slide, please. Okay, so the first STTF project, which was mentioned by Michael just now, actually uh, involved cooperation with ASEAN countries. So actually, uh, the success of this project was uh, detailed in one uh, of the website. Uh, you can access the website in the STTF website. So the website would tell uh, if you are interested to assess, to tell you the how we uh, manage to conduct the studies okay, from generation of our residue from the field phase onto the laboratory phase, and then we submitted data to uh, the MPR for establishment of Codex MRL. Okay, next slide. Okay. So this diagram shows an overview of part of the first project. Uh, actually, uh, there are other countries involved. In this slide, I only uh, show uh, Malaysia, Singapore, Brunei, and the Philippines. But there are also there was also other countries uh, which were Thailand, Indonesia, and Vietnam. Okay, so. Uh, Madi, uh, which uh, Madi, the organization that I'm working with, in, uh, involved in this project on the field phase of the uh, projects. Actually, uh, there were two phases, field and the analytical phase. So in the field phase, uh, we were tasked to generate residue data for um, pyroxifen on mango and also on papaya. Okay, so next slide, please. Okay, when the project was first started in year 2013, actually, uh, before the project actually officially started, actually, Michael uh, came to Malaysia in the year 2012. Uh, at that time, uh, we managed to correspond, correspond through email uh, on the possibility of uh, conducting field training. So uh, Michael has shown commitment and willingness, willingness to come to Malaysia and to conduct hands-on training. And at that time, I accept his uh, offer. Then uh, even though before the project has started, because uh, at that time, we would like to uh, learn uh, how to uh, conduct residue study. Then uh, I believe in the month of May, he came to Malaysia okay, to uh, perform hands-on training. So during the hands-on training, everything uh, that I think Michael has described in yesterday's presentation, uh, from the calibration of the spraying equipment, uh, uh, walking speed, I think everything is uh, detailed out in the hands-on training. So we learn a lot during that uh, hands-on training. But apart from that hands-on training, uh, in the first project, uh, I think Michael also has uh, conducted uh, some sort of field training for all the members of the projects. And also we also include uh, invited observer from the ASEAN uh, member states and the training was conducted in January 2013. Okay, next slide, please. So what we learned, uh, especially uh, in the field training, as I mentioned just now, we calibrate the spring equipment, then walking speed. But apart from that, uh, we need to make a few measurements. So this is, uh, shown uh, during the hands-on training. So Michael uh, taught us how to measure the actual area of the plot. And then uh, after calibration of the walking speed, we have these uh, pesticide applications 
the actual application of the test item or the item to be studied and uh, followed by the sampling protocol and then um, we have also learned how to ship samples to a local laboratory and Singapore if you remember in my few previous slides I also include Singapore in the in the chart so Singapore also include in this study uh, Singapore analyzed a uh, number of samples from the uh, few trials that uh, I have conducted so we learn how to ship the sample without uh, affecting the sample integrity and also the most important thing is uh, the quality assurance of the field phase of the supervised field trial so uh, we learn how to conduct a proper auditing of the uh, few studies and everything has to be recorded okay next please so uh, the benefits that uh, we got from this training I would say is very very tremendous especially in conducting a residue trial according to the good laboratory practice standards so so every minor details of the study has to be recorded in the field measurements and my advice to the new participants if uh, Michael happened to be in your country to conduct hands-on training uh, please seize this opportunity uh, because all when he is in your country he will be he has nowhere to go only with you so you should seize this opportunity to learn from him and to ask as many questions as you could so he will be I believe he will be willing to help and offer his uh, technical and experience expertise to you all apart from this uh, uh, training I think other benefit that I got uh, was uh, the networking and the continuous uh, collaboration with international partners so after the, uh, the first STTVF project uh, was concluded and then Michael still um, would include me in the in the current projects and also in other projects so I think this uh, would be a good approach to other newcomers in this project also to network with other uh, participants and also with the IR4 I think it will uh, greatly help uh, your countries next please okay I think that would be uh, my description of my field training experience uh, in the first uh, project now I would like to touch on the second uh, part of my presentation um, pesticide compatibility okay Mike, Michael mentioned uh, that uh, we need to conduct a few trial of a number of uh, pesticides uh, then uh, Michael he assigned me to uh, perform a pesticide compatibility test so in this test I have to mix a few formulation of pesticide in a single solutions okay so the purpose is to know whether the mixture is compatible so that if it is, is compatible then we can apply this mixture on the few a uh, few uh, few test site okay um, so we have to do this compatibility test before the trial begin okay, next please okay uh, in the table shown here they are I classify according to the group the R5 group okay um, and as for the group number one uh, there are list of uh, pesticide I arrange in the alphabetically order so this group, this first group uh, I have to mix the all these pesticides if you and the list was given by Michael and I in if you notice in the first row uh, 
uh, I highlight in red for three compounds, acetate, metomil, and profinophos. Initially, Michael requested uh, me to test all these compounds, but unfortunately, in Malaysia, I could not find any of uh, gap registration or good agriculture practice registration for the use on chili pepper for these three highlighted compounds, which are hardacifate, metomil, and profinophos. Uh, because of that, I only managed uh, to do a mixture for the other seven compounds. Okay, that that was for the first group, and the second group uh, for the uh, for countries like uh, Bangladesh and Nepal. So I have to mix acetamiplit, imidacloprid, and malathion. Unfortunately, uh, there are registration in Malaysia for these three uh, pesticides. To, uh, on greens to control aphids, white fly, and grasshoppers, and diamond back moth. And then group three, uh, coparifos, cypermetrin for countries Cambodia and Laos. But um, I did not perform any compatibility test for group three because uh, in Malaysia we have a product premix for coparifos and cypermetrin. Okay. And for group four, Metalaxyl hexaconazole, propiconazole, these are fungicides. Okay, I, I performed the test. I will show the result later. In, and group five, uh, no test because only involve single compound. Okay, next please. So these are the procedure given by Michael uh, for me to do the pesticide compatibility test. So it's quite, uh, the procedure is quite long. So for your benefit, I think you can download the slide and then if you can perform on other mixture, it's, it will be beneficial. Next, please. Okay. So in, during the mixing, I have to make a few observations, uh, which were uh, to notice if there were any color change in the solution of the mixture. And then uh, to, after the mixing of every uh, formulation sequentially, I have to not, uh, take note of this uh, observation uh, in terms of color change, whether there's any heat generated, exothermic effects and the new precipitation um, observed in the mixture. After that, we have to filter the solution to see any remaining sol solid trapped in the sieve or in the filter mechanism. And I host and we have to observe whether there is a phytotoxic effect of the solution mixture, meaning that after the mixtures of uh, pesticide formulations uh, was prepared, we have to spray onto weeds. Uh, this was instructed by Michael, so I had to spray on the weeds and, and make an observation at a certain interval, three, four, uh, three, seven, and fourteen days after. Application. We have to make intervals to see any uh, phytotoxic effect, such as this color, uh, uh, brown or yellowish color on the leaves of the weeds. So these are the thing. Uh, there are one other test I did not include in the slides. I think uh, Michael in the procedure he did mention that we have to. Uh, Test with, uh, when we spray using knapsack sprayer, we see the no observe at the nozzle whether the spray uh, pattern is uniform or whether there's any clogging. Okay. Next, please. Okay. So this was the result of the uh, pesticide complete compatibility test on group number one. Okay, so I first I add abamatin 
onto the uh, one liter of water solution of course this is the first uh, formulation after that followed by core party for uh, uh, second product the second product is a premix uh, product uh, containing core party force and cypermetrin so in the mixture of the second product and then i observed that the color still remain whitish and they uh, i think there was no precipitation no heat generated and no solid trap in the sieve so after that i can proceed to the next compound a uh, diazinon so then followed by amitras acetamiprid imidacropy and triponium next please okay so this is the result for the group two only involve uh, three compound three products so first was malathion followed by imidacloprid and acetamiprid next please okay so from this picture there are no other precipitations so this liquid is very i think free from any solids next please okay i mentioned that group number three i did not perform the test and now is group number four the fungicides so group propiconazole hexaconazole and metalaxyl next please okay for this group four there are remaining solids in the solutions but i observe that uh, this only happened when i add uh, the the third formulation metalaxyl uh, okay can uh, can we go back to the previous slide yeah okay so the first formulation propiconazole was in liquid form uh, in ec formulation emulsified concentrate the second hexaconazole i believe is in S, uh, sc formulation and the third metalaxyl uh, the formulation was in uh, wp vegetable powder formulations okay so the solids only observed after i add the third formulation metalaxyl the wp formulation next please so i believe uh, this i my opinion is this is not a precipitation and this is i think remaining undissolved uh vegetable powder formulations of uh, metalaxyl despite so uh, i think a number of minutes i think five minutes more than five minutes of stirring the solid still persists so maybe michael has other if he uh, can offer his opinion on this but uh, from my observation uh, they are still solids next please so we can see here the solids are trapped in the sieve on the sieve next please so i can conclude um, the pesticides are uh, were compatible meaning that no exothermic effects, precipitations, or filter solids. Uh, for group uh, one and group two, I think we can safely mix that all the pesticides. But for group four, uh, excluding metalaxyl, uh, the WP formulation, I think the rest of the pesticide were compatible, meaning that uh, propiconazole and hexaconazole uh, were compatible. To be mixed. Next, please. Okay. 
as requested by Michael, I have to conduct phytotoxic effect observations. So in the picture shown here, I have uh, four pictures. The top left was the control, and then the top right, group one, bottom left, group two, and bottom right, group four. And this were observation on three days after application. The wheat still looks green. So I, at that time, I assume no toxic, phytotoxic effect up to day three. Then I have to make another observation for uh, seven days after application. Next, please. These were the pictures. Uh, taken for uh, at seven days after application. So again, the wheat still looks healthy and green. Next slide, please. Okay. Up to seven days after application, uh, there was no phytotoxic effect for group one, two, and four. And the last observation, uh, I actually, I have actually made the observation, uh, but I did not include in this slide. Uh, actually, even at uh, 14 days after application, the weeds in, the, in those plots still looks healthy. So I can conclude that uh, for the three mixtures from the three groups. There were no phytotoxic effects observed. Next, please. So I would like to thank uh, Dr. Braverman for guiding me in performing the uh, pesticide compatibility test and Mr. Shahid Mr. Azaha and Mrs. Jamalia for helping me to conduct the compatibility test. I think that will conclude my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nan. So um, we have time for some questions. If you have any questions, appreciate if you can uh, type them in the chat box. And I will let uh, Gan have the first opportunity to answer the question if he feels comfortable. Um, so, uh, Nan, I don't know if you can see the chat box, but there's a, I think this is more of a comment from, uh, from Santi in Cambodia uh, saying that the undissolved solid remain is just the impurity or binder which is used with the pesticide formulation. So, uh, Nan, maybe you want to have any uh, comment about your thoughts on his comment? Okay, I th thank you uh, for the comment, Santi. I think maybe he is right. Maybe yes, uh, this is my impurity of binder remaining. Maybe the, the active ingredient was fully dissolved, only that maybe the remaining inert ingredient was left. So maybe it depends on the quality of the formulations. And the metalaxy formulation that I used actually was from the generic company. So I think maybe this was the reasons. Yeah, I, I would I would agree with uh, your observations and, and also the comment. In addition, I, I would say the what what you observed in in the flask uh, look looked fairly uniform, and so it didn't look it didn't look like a precipitate. It looked like like just uh, as was described, uh, just the binder. Uh, that was used to carry the active ingredient. And uh, I, I, I was wondering if we have any possible follow-up comments. Uh, I saw Dr. 
Phong Tran from Vietnam was on the line earlier. I don't know if he is still on the line. Uh, Asel, if you can unmute his line. Uh, Tong Tran from Vietnam. Uh, did you want to make any comments uh, about the um, the metal axle? Have you done any follow-up work? Uh, so, uh, Dr. Tung Tran, uh, is your line unmuted? Hello? Yes, Cell. So. I, I cannot override his control. He must make himself audible. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. So uh, Santi is from himself. Laos, not Cambodia. Oh, okay. Sorry if I said something wrong. Okay. Yes. Uh, all right. Very good. So I think we've answered that question or that discussion. There's another question or another comments uh, from Sri in Indonesia. Uh, is the standard solutions have the same compatibility with the formulation? Well, we were using formulated products in the um, in the test, so I'm not sure if I fully understood your your question. Did, however, the pest, so she added an additional comment here. However, the pesticide comp compound may co-precipitate, and we cannot assure the concentration is good. Uh, I think in our experience, we, we we have done this, and I think the type of testing that we have done is adequate. Uh, for the purposes of, of this type of work. Uh, if we don't see any, any uh, considerable physical uh, uh, presence of a precipitate, I'm not really that concerned about the concentration because it will be physically, it will be applied and it will be available to the plant and can be absorbed. Uh, can there be some type of other co-precipitate? Uh, that we don't really know. However, physically, uh, as long as there's nothing uh, there to clog the nozzles, there shouldn't be any reason why that active ingredient shouldn't, shouldn't be available uh, to the plant. So I, I, I think this type of testing is adequate. And I see uh, some additional comments back from Vietnam. Uh, they have not been able to find the EC formulation. So I, I guess we will be using a different formulation. Uh, but I, I would agree that the, uh, the situation with the metal axle is primarily uh, a situation where it's just a, a binder or some carrier uh, and not a true precipitation. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, are there any additional questions? Well, I, I also, um, well, maybe we can uh, have a few minutes in case there are other questions or none, if you want to make any other follow-up comments. Okay. So according to the agenda, uh, the next item on the agenda is uh, going over a field data notebook. So yesterday uh, we talked about, you know, the different types of data that you have to collect and the importance of documenting that into the field data notebook. And so today, we're going to follow that up by looking at, at the field data notebook itself. And then we will uh, follow that up by a, a, an example. Uh, and these notebooks are slightly different because uh, this first uh, part that I'm going to go over is for the 2020 
uh, year field data notebook. So as we uh, progress in time and we learn things, sometimes some of the emphasis on the studies might change slightly. We tend to add some things uh, from, uh, from our experience into the notebook. Uh, I also, before I begin, I want to follow up on uh, Nan's presentation. First of all, thank you very much for your presentation. Excellent job. Uh, also, I want to note that Malaysia will be part of the team teaching. So originally, we had planned to have a, a group field training in Malaysia. As everybody knows, uh, unfortunately, due to the coronavirus, uh, we were not able to hold that meeting. However, uh, I will still be providing the one-on-one -on -one training uh, for the new countries, uh, which will include Cambodia, Pakistan, Laos, Bangladesh, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. Uh, those are our new countries to this, to this type of work. And so we will be providing one-on-one uh, -on -one training. In addition, uh, we have made provisions uh, for Malaysia uh, to follow up on some of the field work as needed. So uh, Nan and Shahid might be uh, visiting your countries as a follow-up uh, in case you have any issues that arise with uh, developing your plans for the field work. It was also mentioned uh, that the, uh, the compatibility testing was not performed on, uh, for, for the basal trial involving chlorpyrifos and cypromethrin. And that was because there already exists a premix. So we already know that they're compatible. There's no issue. Uh, with that, are there any questions uh, to anything that was covered uh, in regard to uh, what was the information and training that Malaysia received or the compatibility testing that they have performed? Okay. Uh, if there are no questions, I will uh, start into the field data notebook. So what you should s see on the screen <laughs> is the 2020 uh, field data notebook. So this is just the, the cover page. You can scroll down, please. So this is the chain of custody form. So as the notebook is being transferred from one person to another person, then they will make the entry into the, into the notebook. Okay, next page, please. You can see there's many spaces for the, for the uh, notebook to be transferred. Okay, keep scrolling down, please. Okay, so this, this page is describing some of the new things that have been uh, changed uh, in the 2020 notebook, because these notebooks uh, become revised pretty much every year. So uh, they note here that they've added uh, a section for seed treatment. This we have increased the number of seed treatment type trials that we have done. And so that was added to the notebook. Uh, parts 1A and B have been merged regarding SOPs. And there's a single checkoff now in place for GLP compliance. Address has been revised to office address. And 
I, I won't go through all of these changes. I, you'll, you'll receive a copy of this uh, electronically, and then you can look through this on your own. Okay. If we can go down uh, past all these changes to the next page. Okay. So these are the general instructions uh, outlining the different parts of the notebook. Uh, so part one is for good laboratory practice compliance. Part two, you list the personnel. Part three is for notes and communication. Part four is for test substance records. Part five, trial site information. Part six, the application records. Part seven, sample collection and storage. Eight, residue sample shipping. Part nine, weather and irrigation records. And then part 10, protocol and protocol changes. Okay, so this, again, this is, what I'm gonna go here through here, this is just gonna be a blank notebook. You could scroll down, please. Keep scrolling down, please. Okay, if you could stop here. So here it provides instructions. If you look at item six, this is what we discussed yesterday. Uh, all entries should be clear, understandable, legible, and made with a pen in indelible blue or black ink. Changes to raw data can only be made by drawing a single line through the original entry so as not to obscure it. Okay. So the date, signature, or initials, and reason, reasons for the change must be accompanied by an error code. And these are some of the acceptable error codes. So AW is accidental write-over. CE is a calculation error. EE, entry error. IE, illegible entry. Uh, IW, inappropriate word. LE is late entry, ME is a measurement error, NA not applicable, NI new information, PE pagination error, SP spelling error, DE transcription error, UE unnecessary entry, NR not recorded, and WE wrong entry. So these are some examples uh, that are listed in the, fo in, in the front of the field data notebook. So suppose I was writing something and I used one of these words in, in one of these sentences. Okay, so here you, you can see in these sentences, it has the word error, okay? So I'm gonna try to write it big enough that you can see. Now normally you would not write it this big, right? All right, so there's the word error. Okay, so I don't know how to spell very well. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, it's probably pretty difficult. Um, but anyway, I, I misspelled it as E-R-R-A-R. -R -R. So that's not the way you spell error. So what should I do? I need to make a correction. So the so this spe, this word is spelled wrong. So I would put a single line through it. I don't know if you can see. I have put a single line through it. I think maybe you're trying to change the view. That would be good. All right. So I put a single line through it, and then who made this change? So the person that made the change is me, Michael Braverman. So I would put my 
I would put my initials MB. Again, I don't, I don't know if you can see, I've added my initials MB. So I'm saying that I'm the one who made this change. So obviously you want to spell it correctly. So you would want to spell E-R-R-O-R, -R -R, right? Okay, and then you have to describe the reason why you made this change. Why did you Why did you cross this one out? So can we go back to that that page with the codes on it? Nui? Yes. All right. So here it provides uh, the codes. So if you look at the code, it has the code SP. So SP is a spelling error. So I would add the letter SP. And I've done that. I don't know if you can see that over here. And then when we use the error code, we circle. It's not required, it says it's not required, but I, I strongly suggest it. And I would like you to do it. The reason why we circle, the reason why we circle the error code is because it's possible that for some people, the two letter error code may be the same letters as their initials. Right? So we want to distinguish that. And then, then we ha also have to tell what date we made this correction. So today is uh, the 26th of August, 2020. So you would, you would add the date to tell when you made this change. So you have you have the original entry, which has had a single line through it, so you can still see. You've had the correction. You have uh, put in the error code to explain the reason why you changed it. You have the initials of the person that made the change, and you have the date that this change was made. Okay, so what happened if if I made this error and I didn't notice it today, okay? I didn't notice it uh, until sometime in the future. Let's say um, I was looking through the notebook, I was reading the notebook, and I, I noticed uh, on September 1st, that this word was spelled wrong. Okay. So what what do you think I should do? If I if I didn't notice it, if I didn't notice this error until September first, should I just ignore it? Uh, should I correct it the same way? Should I correct it a different way? Does every anybody want to try to uh, guess what I should do? by looking at the error codes that you see on the screen. If you'd like, you could try to uh, place your answer in the chat box. Okay, so if we look over the error codes, you'll notice that there is an error co code called a late entry. Late entry. So if I if I didn't notice if I didn't notice this mistake until September first, I would also add the code L E with a circle to note that it's a late entry, and I, I would not have put I would not have put the date as twenty sixth of August twenty twenty. I would have the date as first of September 2020.
So whenever you make an entry, you always put the date that you're actually making that entry or that change. You never backdate uh, the entry, okay? Are there any questions about the correction process? So it's, it's, it's okay, everybody makes errors. It happens all the time. And that's not a problem. Uh, it's just that under GLPs, we have a specific way of, of correcting errors, okay? Okay, so if you can uh, scroll down, please. You can keep scrolling down. Okay, um, so this is a form uh, for optional pages that were removed from the field data notebook. So in case there were some pages that you didn't need, uh, you can simply remove them from uh, from the notebook, okay? And this is just documenting that those pages have been removed. Who removed them? As indicated by initials and the date that they were removed, okay? And then down below, you also see here additional pages inserted into the field data notebook. In a lot of, a lot of cases, there may be other documents that you want to keep with the notebook, uh, but are not part of the original notebook. So you can include them uh, and document that you've added pages. Okay. You can continue scrolling down, please. So here's an example of pages that have been added to a notebook, okay? You can scroll down, please. And these are just additional, an additional form in case you ha needed more area to add additional pages. Okay, scroll down, please. You keep scrolling, please. Okay, you can stop right there. So you see on, it should be on the top of every page, you should have a space for entering the field data notebook, the ID number. So this would be the trial ID number. Where do you think you would find the trial ID number? Anybody want to guess and put an entry into the chat? Okay. Uh, so uh, the answer is you'd find it in the protocol, right? Because the protocol lists the uh, the number for this for for the particular trial. So for each trial, you have one note what notebook for one trial. If you have three trials, you will have three notebooks. So each trial gets its own notebook. So here, uh, you're claiming that you followed the laboratory practices, I, and then you'd put your name in here, and then you would say uh, that you uh, conducted this trial under good laboratory practices, except some of the following. So uh, weather, so you may may be collecting weather from a weather station and that data is not GLP compliant. So you would put no. Uh, test site history, the location where you're conducting the trial, it's possible you may be conducting this trial in a farmer's field. And if that's the case, they may be telling you what they applied to that field the previous few years, but those are not GLP records. Okay? Uh, any cultural practices, uh, any adjuvant data, environmental monitoring devices, a GPS if you're using 
a lot of times these things will not be GLP. They may be, they may not be. Uh, so this is an opportunity for you to claim what you did that was not following GLPs. Can you scroll down a little bit? And then you see you have a blank section here at the bottom for any additional non-compliant items that you want to declare. Okay, And then you would sign it and date it. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. Our next, uh, scroll down on the next page, please. So again, you have a space up at the top for entering uh, the trial ID number. And this is part two for the personnel involved in the trial. So you put the name of the field research director, whoever the field research director is for the protocol. Uh, their name, affiliation, their office address, uh, city, state, or province, and that may not be applicable for you. Uh, zip code, a telephone, an uh, email, and then sign and date. You probably are not doing this trial only by yourself in the field. And so uh, there could be other personnel involved in the study. So they would print their name, sign it themselves, initials, and date. That way, if they uh, need to make an entry into the notebook, they can just use their initials. And you have an example of their initials here at the front of the, the notebook. Okay, are there any questions over the sections of the notebook I covered so far? <clears throat> okay, so on the first section on part two, you, you listed the people and here, you're listing the qualifications of those people. So things about their education, their work experience, uh, usually GLP training. Here they say special training or qualifications. Okay, you can scroll down to the next page, please. Okay, we have a question. What do you mean by initials? Okay, so for example, uh, your name is Santi Kongmeni. So your initials would be S-K. So it's the first letter of your name. First letter of your first name, first letter of, of your last name. All right? So my name is Michael Braverman. So my initials, do you remember when I made uh, this correction? I don't know if you can see it. I put the initials MB. So that stands, that stands for my name. So in the future, when anybody wants to enter something into the notebook, uh, it would take up more room if they had to sign everything. So they're allowed to just use their initials. Okay. Okay, then here in this next section, as you see on the screen, uh, are the uh, training summary. So if they've had training, they would enter it here. So uh, for those of you on this call, you are having training right now. You had training yesterday and today. And at the end, you will receive a certificate that you participated in this training. And that will become part of your records. Okay? So you would just list it here. Or you can create a log uh, of your own and then just provide a copy of it. Next. Can you scroll down, please?
Okay. So this is part three, notes and communication. So if you are discussing something with the, with the study director, who will be me, uh, every time that you have a conversation with me, uh, let's say we have a conversation by WhatsApp, or we, uh, we exchange email, that email should be printed out, it should be uh, dated and initialed. And you put a copy of that in this section of the notebook. Okay? Can you go down to the next page, please? And here's just an additional page. Okay, can you stop please? So again, uh, as I mentioned at the top of every page, you should have a place to put the ID number. This is part four, test substance records. So the test substance is what you're gonna be applying in the field. That's the active ingredient or the active ingredients, if it's more than one. So you enter the name of the test substance on the container the batch or lot number, the date you received it, and when it expires. Then you enter what is the source of the expiration date. So the expiration date should be provided by the manufacturer or the company that produces that product. If there is no expiration date, what do you think you should do? you should contact the study director, okay? Also, uh, what happens if you have your uh, material, you receive it, it's not expired, but by the time you start the study, by the time the, top, the crop is ready to spray, it's expired. Uh, well, again, you have to contact the study director and see whether or not uh, they can uh, either get new material or see if the material has been recharacterized. Okay. So is the material uh, a GLP material? Okay, so either yes or no. If it's no, then enter the date that the study director was informed. If yes, what is the source of the GLP status? Usually it will when you receive this test substance, it will come with a certificate of analysis. So the certificate of analysis indicates whether or not it was characterized under GLP. Here you can include uh, the carrier tracking number. Uh, a lot of times these are shipped uh, by uh, USPS or FedEx or some carrier that would have a a number, okay? Individual who received the test substance, the amount you received, the number of containers, what did the container look like? Was it glass? Was it a water-soluble packet? Was it a plastic container? What was the condition? Was it intact? Was it broken? Was it leaking? Was the test substance held temporarily in another location prior to its transfer to long-term storage? It's either yes or no. If yes, then you would enter the location. Okay. Any questions over what I've covered so far? Okay. Next page, please. So these are logs. So here you see it says test substance records 
use log. So this is the name of the product, the batch lot number, the container ID, and description of the, of the test substance. And who enters this information? So let's say you were making an application today and you needed to use 10 mils. If it was today, then you would enter today's date here. You would enter the, the amount, 10 mils. The purpose, uh, the purpose is to, uh, for use in applying the treatment and then for whatever trial number it is. And then you enter your initials and date. Okay, next slide, please. Or I should say, scroll down. Okay, uh, this section is for disposition of the test substance container. So in other words, after you're finished with the study, uh, you should retain the, the container until you are told by the study director that you can uh, get rid of the container uh, in a way that is appropriate for your country, or if you ship the container back to the company. If you can scroll down, please. And you can see this is a form to document that. Can you scroll to the next page, please? Uh, this is another uh, type of form for, uh, for an adjuvant. An adjuvant is something that is used to enhance the activity of a pesticide. Uh, and it lists some examples here, like a crop oil concentrate, methylated seed oil, methylated spray oil, non-ionic surfactant silicone surfactant, vegetable oil, or something else. So if you receive any of these types of products, you would use this form. Okay. You can go to the next page. So when you receive the test substance, you need to monitor the temperature that you're storing the test substance under. So this is a form. You'd identify the storage location, a unique identification number for the thermometer or temperature recorder, and then you'd enter the date, the minimum and maximum temperature, and then your initials. And then you do that on every day that you have the test substance stored. An alternative, is that you can print out uh, if you have some kind of monitoring device which has a logger and will indicate the temperatures over time, you could use that instead of this form. Okay. We can scroll down to the next page, please. Okay, so test substance records, this is for a calibration of a balance, okay? So if you have a test substance, which is, for example, a wettable powder, and you need, let's say you needed to weigh 10 grams, you would need to use a calibrated balance in order to weigh that test substance. So this is a form for documenting the calibration. And you notice, oh, stop please. Can you go up a little bit? Can you go up a little more? Good, that's very good. Do you notice here, it says optional, right? So you may only have liquids in your trial. If you only have liquids, well then you don't need this page. That's why it's optional. Are there any questions over any of the pages that I've covered so far? Okay. 
Uh, can you scroll down to the next page, please? Okay, uh, uh, please. So here, uh, this is test substance and seed records. Uh, this would more commonly be used uh, if you're doing a seed treatment study. So here you'll notice that it says name of test substance formulation on treated seed. So sometimes we do uh, studies on residues from seeds that have been treated. And sometimes the manufacturer will supply the seed which has already been treated. All right, very good. Now, can you scroll down to the next page, please? So you can see this involves a lot of documentation. So this is a, a seed chain of custody for I, either untreated seed or treated seed. Keep scrolling down, please. Here are additional uh, seed records for what you did with the seed either the untreated seed or the treated seed. And this is also uh, for documentation if you are treating the seed yourself. You can go down to the next page, please. Okay, so this is an additional page for uh, use of an inoculant. An inoculant is a type of uh, seed treatment that is commonly used with legumes. Uh, so uh, there are some types of beneficial organisms that are sometimes applied to seed, for example, to help to uh, fix nitrogen in the soil. So sometimes there are some legumes uh, that you will treat the seed and it will have tiny little bumps or nodules on the roots and those are infections uh, by the inoculating bacteria. Okay. Uh, can you scroll down to the next page please? Okay, so just like uh, the temperature storage records for the test substance, uh, if you have seed, you want to know the storage temperatures of the seed. We're not planning on doing any, any studies with seed. I'm just telling you what we currently have in our notebook. Can you go down to the next page, please? Okay, so if you're weigh, weighing seed, you also need to calibrate the sprayer. I mean, I'm sorry, calibrate the balance. So uh, what you would do is you would want to have, uh, use a mass of, of, of a standard weight that is uh, one that's above and one that's below the mass that you want to determine. So if you wanted to uh, weigh out five grams of seed, you would want to use a check weight that is probably one gram and 10 grams, or you could even use a one gram, five gram, and 10 gram to show that your balance is, is calibrated properly. All right, uh, down on the next page, please. Okay, so then this is just a, a page to say behind this page, if you have any other documents to add, 
these added in this area. That's all it is. Okay, so if you're going to be conducting a field study, you have to you have to describe where this study is located. Okay. So this is directions to the web to, to the the test site. So you come from the more general directions. For example, if you are doing uh, a trial on a on a farmer's field, the first set of directions will would be how to get from your office to where the farm is located. Okay. And then you would have more more specific details, maybe uh, directions from the last paved road to where the farm starts. Okay. Can you go down to the next page, please? So this is just an area to draw a map, and as well as provide a description. These are another place for des for describing the directions to the plot area. So this is a checklist for the plot plan. Okay. Do you have the dimensions and locations of the treated and untreated plots? Dimensions and locations of buffer zones? So the buffer zone is the area between where the treated plot is and the untreated plot. That's called a buffer. So it's the area between those two. Okay. Do you have distance to permanent landmarks from at least two plot corners? Or you can use GPS coordinates. Did you indicate the distance between untreated plot and all treated plots in the study? Did you include the north direction, the slope, the number of rows? Have the plots been labeled? Distances and relative locations of immediately adjacent plots. Identify the test chemicals used on the plot. Uh, you can scroll down to the next page. Okay, so here you're describing the trial site information. So this is more specific, okay? So here you have the date of the plot layout, who, who performed it. So what would you put in this spot? You would put your initials. Here you would cite the SOP that you used. Are there adjacent plots treated with the test substance? If yes, when was the adjacent plot information added to this map? Uh, if a GPS was used for the plot location, enter GPS related SOP revision used. Okay, so this you'd be providing a more detailed map of the plot itself. Okay, if you can scroll down to the next page, please. So here's some additional information about the trial site. Uh, the percent slope in the plot, the soil texture, and then the percent sand, silt, and clay, percent organic matter, pH and cation exchange capacity. And then it's asking whether or not this is a field trial or is this a greenhouse trial using non soil growing media? Okay.
Okay. Next section, part five, is the trite, the, the test site history form. So here you're gathering information on what active ingredients have been applied to this particular site in previous years. That, that way, if something unusual comes out in the analysis and the chemist says, oh, you have, uh, you have malathion in this sample, but we never applied it you would understand that it must have come from a, a, a previous application. The other thing that's even more important is know that the test substance that you're trying to do the research on should not have been applied uh, in the previous year. You don't want to go back into the same soil that has been treated with the substance that you need to analyze for. Uh, next page, please. Okay, so here you're uh, giving information about when you initiated the trial, uh, when you planted, it could be seed, or when the grower planted the trees. Uh, information about the dimensions, such as the row or bed width, the number of rows per plot, and the number of rows per bed, uh, both the width and the number of beds, uh, and then all the dimensions of the plots. What is the source of the seeds that you use or transplants? And is there a lot, a lot number to those seeds? I'll go down to the next page, please. All right. This is a page for you to document any cultural practices. A cultural practice would be something such as uh, I applied fertilizer. Uh, I, uh, I uh, removed weeds from the field. Okay. Any type of activity that is, you know, typically used in growing a crop is called a cultural practice. And you'd enter that information here. So the operation is what you did, when you did it, and what's the source of the information. Uh, what equipment was used, and then initials and date. Okay, so for maintenance and fertilizers, uh, this is a form to add that type of information. Next page, please. Okay, this is a uh, form for documenting that you have destroyed the crop. If, so, if, for example, if you are uh, working on a crop and the product you're applying is not currently registered in your country, then, uh, well, at least under U.S. law, you can't, you can't harvest the crop and, and, and give it to people if it's been treated with an unregistered product. So you have to document that you've destroyed the crop. So, uh, for example, if you were working with an unregistered product and you applied it to the basil crop at the end of the season, you would want to, uh, you know, finish, uh, stop growing that basil and, and destroy it. If it's a tree or something more like uh, dragon fruit, for example, you would simply remove all the fruit at that time and then whenever the next cycle is it, it it's no longer needed the crop destruct is no longer needed okay next page please okay so 
these are just some additional informations on the uh, on the plot plan. Okay. You scroll down to the next page. So this is another page uh, to provide a map of what the plot plan looks like. Next page, please. All right, this is additional place to enter uh, test crop records for seed treatment. Uh, scroll down, next page, please. Okay, application records, part six. So first you're gonna describe the equipment that you used. So are you using a tractor, a backpack sprayer? Is it a granular applicator? And then you can describe it. What is uh, the propellant? In other words, what is uh, the way in which the test substance is being uh, expelled or pushed out of the sprayer? Is it pressurized by CO2, compressed air? Is there a pump or something else? Uh, where is the application made? Is it foliar? Is it to the ground? Is it broadcast? Is it banded? Is it directed or in furrow or something else? Uh, the number of passes that are needed to treat the plot. Uh, in some cases, if it's a really small crop, you may be able to spray you know, right over the top of the crop. But if for a larger crop, uh, for even just a small tree or a bush, you probably can't treat it from the top, so you have to treat it from two sides. So you need two passes for every row. And then you're describing also uh, more information on the strainers within your particular spray system. Next page, please. So this is a space to provide a diagram. You could you can include a diagram. You can you can hand draw the diagram, or you could simply include uh, pictures of your equipment. Next page, please. All right. So here we're starting to get into page. Uh, part six for calibration. So what is the equipment that you uh, calibrated and when and who? Okay. Next page, please. And then there's a space you see for, cal for calculations. Yeah, this is a good table right here. That's a good place to stop, okay? Very good. So remember from yesterday's training, we said we had to have three consecutive outputs that are within how much? Anybody remember? What's considered an acceptable calibration? They have to be within a certain percent of each other. Don't, don't, move, don't move the table yet. Anybody want to answer that question? We have 67 people on the line, so I hope I hope one of them remembers uh, from yesterday. Don't don't scroll. Don't don't move the table, please. Does anybody remember what is the acceptable uh, percent error in in the calibration with the, for the output sprayer output? Nobody remembers? Can somebody type? Oh, all right. Gain some responses in the chat box. All right. Well, uh, we have two. We have two answers. Uh, one person is saying uh, five to ten percent, 
and the other is saying plus or minus 5%. Okay, so this is for the calibration of the sprayer. Remember, the calibration is what you do in advance of the application. So the correct answer is plus or minus 5%. There was another answer of 5 to 10%. So uh, minus 5% to plus 10%, that's an acceptable range for the application. But only 5% is acceptable for the calibration. Okay? Thank you. All right, you can scroll down to the next page. Or actually, further down in this page. Okay, stop there. Oh, oops. Okay, so you can see uh, there's a place you calculate the mean output per nozzle, uh, determine the total volume, and so you remember each one of these columns is one, two, and three for your three consecutive outputs. And then you determine the mean. And once you determine the mean, you said, uh, was this uh, uh, within 5% of the original calibration? Either yes or no. Okay. Uh, can you go down to the next page, please? Okay, so you not only have to calibrate, stop there, please. So you not only have to calculate the output of the sprayer, you also have to calibrate the speed. Okay, so it could be it could be you walking, right? It could be your walking speed. Remember we discussed that yesterday, and you can help uh, get a more uniform walking speed by using a certain piece of equipment. Do you remember what that equipment was called? Anybody want to try to put that into the uh, chat box? Is trying to get an answer. Metronome beats. Very good. So you remember we uh, we went over the app. Uh, I provided a link for you. Uh, hopefully you've uh, tried to uh, download that on your phone. So you could you could use that uh, app, uh, and uh, most probably if you're using it in the field, you may want to use headphones, especially if you're using a motorized sprayer. That might make quite a bit of noise. So you may want to use headphones so you can hear the metronome clearer. You know when it's going beep, 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 beep. Okay, so uh, can you scroll down a little bit, please? So here you're describing how you did the speed calibration. Okay. So you're, you're having one, two, three in a row. Remember, you, you need to have three uh, in a row that are within 5%. And then here there's a space below for you to do your calculations. Okay. So you determine the, the average or the mean of the three runs for the speed. And then you answer, was this uh, the original or was this a, a recheck? And if it was a recheck, was it within 5% of the original? Okay, uh, next page, please. Okay, so these are uh, bases or your calculations. Okay, so you, you have determined your output. You determine your walking speed. You know the size of your plot. And based on that information, you have to calculate what your output is. Okay. Can you scroll down, please, to the next page? So 
Okay, Can you stop there, please? So you've already calculated what the output of your sprayer is. You know your walking speed. You have a certain target rate for your active ingredient. And now you have to calculate, well, how much, how much active ingredient do I need to do or to use? So here you're uh, determining the volume and mixing how much how much test substance and how much water do I need to mix together? Okay, so you'll go through those calculations and write them on this page. Next page, please. Okay, so here you're starting, you, you've already made the calculations. You know how much test substance you need. You know how much water you need, and you're going to mix them together. Okay, so this section is a place to document that. Okay, so you'd enter the treatment number. Is this treatment one, two, or whatever, based on what the protocol says? The number of days since the last application, the previous application. So if this is your first application, you would say not applicable because it's the first application. You'd enter the name of the test substance, a lot number, who mixed it together, the time you mixed it, the equipment that you're using, and the placement of the test substance. Placement means, uh, are you applying it to the soil? Are you applying it to the foliage? Are you applying it to a seed? And here, you're entering the amounts. So carrier, the carrier in most cases will be water, okay? So the starting volume of the water, the amount of formulated product or test substance you used, an adjuvant, if any, and then you have the total volume. Here, you'd enter the total distance from the target. In other words, um, if you're holding a sprayer and this is, this is the tip of your sprayer and uh, this, is your, this is your tree, how far is it from the tip of this sprayer to the target, which is the tree? Okay. Then you'd enter, uh, if you have this type of information, the PSI or, or pounds per square inch, that's the pressure. Uh, if you have a gauge, uh, since you work in met metric, uh, you're more likely to have it in kilopascals. Uh, incorporation, if you incorporate, like if you are mixing it in with soil, you would describe that here. A carrier source and type. The source may be uh, city water. It may be uh, well water from the farm. Uh, what is the pH of the water and temperature? And what equipment did you use to measure the pH? Is it some type of battery operated pH meter? Or did you use, just use litmus paper? Next page, please. So uh, you, you've, now you've described uh, how you mixed up the test substance. Now you're giving a little bit more information on the conditions of the site when you're making the application. Do you indicate the height of the crop, the growth stage, whether it's seed, vegetative, bud, bloom, if it's fruiting, how is the health of the crop? Soil moisture, uh, how, may, how cloudy it is, um, uh, the soil area covered by the crop, air temperature, wind speed, and direction. So you'd enter the, the miles per hour or kilometers per hour. Uh, the clouds in the sky, 
uh, relative humidity, uh, presence of any dew, whether it's heavy, light, or none. Description of the soil tilth, is it smooth? Is it firm? Is it plat? Is it cloddy? Estimate the soil surface moisture. Is it wet, moist, or dry? And then the soil temperature. Right? You can go to the next page, please. Okay, so if you remember during yesterday's training session, I gave an example where you had two rows of fruit trees and you had to make four passes. Remember, you go pass one, two, three, and four because you had, you had two rows of trees and you were treating it from this side, then this side, this side, and this side. So in that example, there were four passes. So here, you would enter the amount of time that it took you to make that individual pass and the direction, okay? So it's very important to collect this information because this is gonna be used to determine what your application rate was. So remember, first, you did the calibration of your walking speed or the speed of your tractor. But here, you're entering the actual time it took to go through the plot and apply the test substance. Are there any questions over what I've covered? Okay. Uh, next slide, please, or, or next page, please. Okay. Now here, uh, part J is post-application rate confirmation. So here, uh, they give you some examples on how to calculate uh, whether or not you've applied the test substance correctly. Okay. Next page, please. Oh, wait, hold on a second. Um, can you go up a little bit? That's good. Stop, please. Okay, so here at the bottom of this page, it says, was the actual application rate within minus five to plus 10% of the protocol? So either yes or no. If no, what do you do? You contact the study director. And was the actual spray volume within the protocol range? So does anybody remember where you'd find the spray volume? Where would you look for that in the protocol? And where would you look for the application rate in the protocol? So that was in section 15, remember? Section 15 described what the application rate should be and what the, the spray volume should be. Okay, uh, down to the next page, please. So here you're documenting uh, was there any phytotoxicity? In other words, was the plant damaged at all? In other words, uh, did it cause any burn to the foliage? Did something uh, change the look of the crop? Can we go down to the next page, please? And you're also indicating whether or not there was any rainfall and whether it occurred. Go to the next page. So, uh, if you're uh, having more than one trial, you have to indicate uh, whether or not these trials were independent, okay? So first question is, are you conducting more than one trial in this study? 
So it could be yes or it could be no. There's another field research director in this study conducting a trial within 20 miles of your trials. And then it's either yes or no. Okay. So we prefer that trials be at least uh, 20 miles apart. And that works out to about uh, 32 uh, uh, 32 kilometers. So uh, the types of uh, differences that are considered acceptable, you would find those in the protocol and they are listed in order to help you to know whether or not the trial was successfully differentiated. So the two most important things are distance and time. So we like a trial to be at least 20 miles from any other uh, trial or about 30 kilometers. And then also uh, a difference of about 30 days in time, okay? So within this section, it also repeats that information. So can you uh, scroll down a little bit, please? Can you go down further? Go down to the next page, please. Okay. So, can you stop? So here, this is uh, a list in this table of what examples are things that contribute to uh, an acceptable se separation. But really, you really need two items to be uh, included. One, the trial site must be separated by at least 20 miles or 32 kilometers. And then the first application or planting date for annual crops in each trial was separated by at least 30 days. Okay. There are other pieces of information that can contribute to trial differentiation, but these two are required. Okay. Are there any questions over what I've covered so far? All right. Can we go down to the next page, please? Okay. So this is for your equipment maintenance and repair. So if you had any equipment that you used, for example, a sprayer, um, you would uh, identify the equipment and whether or not any uh, maintenance was performed on that equipment. Okay, you can go down to the next page, please. Okay, so if you used an air blast sprayer or a uh, a backpack mist blower sprayer. This is a, a way to document uh, that particular use. Okay, and next page, please. So just like the other sprayer information here, you can enter uh, a diagram or you could simply take a photo and enter it here. Next slide, please, or our next page, please, I should say. So these are the application records for the air blast sprayer. Next page, please. Okay. All right, so uh, can you stop, please? Can you go up a little bit? Very good. So 
here you see it says discharge calibration for application number. So in some trials, uh, you can have uh, two applications, three applications. And so if, if this is the second application, you'd want to indicate that here. And so you have to calibrate again uh, the output. Okay, so we had a, a question in our uh, a chat box. Uh, what is, uh, to, first question, what is GPA? Okay, GPA is, <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, we are using uh, the units that we use in the United States. GPA stands for gallons per acre. Now you would more likely use uh, liters per hectare, okay? So on your applications, you will be using liters per hectare. When I make a protocol for you, uh, it will indicate uh, uh, liters per hectare, not gallons per acre. So uh, for example, this is a protocol that was approved uh, for use in a trial Uh, involving uh, trifloxystrobin and flupiram on papaya. And here I have section 15. I don't know if you can see this, um, but here in section 15, it is stating the acceptable range of the volume. And you can see it's in liters per hectare. So it's saying, so this is an actual protocol. And you can see that it's saying uh, 800, 800 to 1,800 liters per hectare. So that's the range, okay? Okay, there was another question. Let me put this away. There was another question. What can we do? If 20 miles separation is not practically is not practically possible, okay. So uh, there are two things you would do. For, for what do you what do you, what does everybody think the first thing that you would do if you had a problem? What would you do? You'd contact the study director, right? So you'd contact me, okay. Uh, what I would inform you to do, uh, I would in inform you uh, to please uh, try to increase the amount of time, especially if you can do one trial in one year and one trial in another year. Uh, that will help. Uh, make the application as far apart as possible. Uh, you may try to include other differences Maybe, uh, for example, if you are doing a, a trial on greens, on, uh, for example, on a mustard oil, uh, you might use a different variety. You may uh, try to use a different end of the range. So, exam for example, if you were to have an acceptable upper and lower range for your spray volume in the protocol, one trial may use uh, a higher volume and the other trial might use a lower volume. You might apply with different equipment. You may apply with a different type of nozzle so that the uh, spray pattern might be different. So you try to increase other type of, types of differences. Okay. I hope I've answered your question. Let's see, are there any other questions over this type of information or over anything I've covered so far today? All right, thank you. All right, can we go to the next section, please? Next page. And this is just a repeat of, of pages for section six. So there are additional pages if there are additional applications. So we, can we uh, go all the way down to where it says part seven? Just keep, keep moving until you get to part seven. Uh, 